the environmental state of the world is pretty bad. That's really forcing more and more people to ask what next, to look for solutions. By 2050, if some dramatic action isn't done, there'll be more items of plastic in the world's oceans than living creatures. We need to commit to not only limiting harm, but we also have a much more proactive approach to the future. We need to find a way to coexist and to be prosperous. We really need to look at the linear take-make-waste model. We need to look at something different, and we think that that different model could be a circular economy. Circular economy is really based on three principles. To eliminate waste and pollution, to keep products and materials in use for longer, and to regenerate natural systems. Well, design is a, is a tool. It's a problem-solving tool primarily. Many of the big global issues that we're facing today can be addressed by design thinking. We need you, the brilliant designers of products, packaging, clothing, objects we use every single day to help us create a better future, a more sustainable future, a regenerative future. The beauty of tech is it can act as an accelerator. It's an enabler to support design of new products and new systems, and in turn supports the sustainable change that we simply must make. Designers have a huge role to play in the shift to a circular economy, but also millions of other people who are involved in the design process. And we estimate that's about 160 million people globally. I would ask designers, business leaders, to look a bit further down the track and ask what the future holds, what policy changes are coming, what are citizens asking for, and what supply chain risks do they expose themselves to if they are constantly dependent on finite resources that come out of a hole in the ground. The circular economy is really about regeneration, so not just reducing the harm and trying to do a bit less bad over time, but actually to, to have a positive impact, to restore, to regenerate so the future gets a bit better rather than just a bit less worse. SAP solutions touch 77% of the world's material flows. We really are unique in our ability to provide that end-to-end -end visibility that no other companies can do. Sustainability has, maybe for too long, been an add-on in a business strategy. But through technology, we have the opportunity, and it really is an opportunity to design the processes and databases required for designers everywhere. And that's really the opportunity here. We can just look around us and say, how could you redesign that for a circular economy? It's truly time for designers to have the insight that they need to make informed circular design choices and enable the circular economy itself. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for those who are tuning in, we'll be talking about the circular design economy and the fashion industry specifically. Um, this is part of a series of talks by the Global Design Forum and Circular Design Project. Um, as you might've gathered from that video that we just watched, this is a collaboration between SAP, excuse me, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the London Design Festival. Um, I have a fantastic panel of experts with me today. I'm going to briefly introduce them um, and tell you a little bit about myself too before we get into it. Um, so first off, I've got Jean-Christophe Chopin, who's the founder of Born, a network of design-led creators and industry leaders from around the world. I have Carol Collet, who's a professor at Central St. Martins, the director of Maison Zero, and the director of Living Systems Lab, um, two initiatives I hope we'll hear more about in due course. Uh, and then I also have, last but not least, Lamban Nguyen, who is the founder of Fashion for Freedom, an organization working with artisans and manufacturers to encourage ethical fashion production. And I'm Fiona Sinclair Scott. I'm the global editor of CNN Style, speaking to you from London, where 
as you all know, we have London Design Festival well underway, and we also have London Fashion Week underway. Um, this is uh, the busiest month in the fashion industry, September, uh, where we see fashion weeks happening around the world from New York to Paris. Um, it's a really exciting time to uh, be part of the fashion industry. As a journalist, I get to see beautiful new designs from some of the world's leading designers unveiled at various fashion weeks, which is always exciting. But I think over the last few years, it's also become a sort of moment of reflection for many people where we really look to consider what fashion's broader impact is um, on the world and in particular climate crisis. Um, so, I certainly take a slightly more somber approach to, <laughs> to fashion month than maybe I once did before. So much so that last, last September, um, kind of in the absence of a regular show schedule as a result of the pandemic, my team um, put together a series of uh, stories under the banner of the September issues um, where we really look to investigate fashion's role in climate crisis. Um, it was a really ambitious project and quite a difficult one to, to carry out. But the biggest takeaway for me was there are no easy solutions. This is not a one solution problem. Um, and so I'm hoping today that what we can do is start to look at the many different solutions that might make up um, some broader change in the shape of a, of a circular economy. Um, and I'm hoping that what we can get out of this is not only a kind of deeper understanding of how to apply this idea of a circular economy to the fashion industry, but also, you know, some really practical thoughts from our panelists on how designers in particular can really involve themselves um, in, in this change and in this process. Um, so uh, if I could throw it back to my wonderful panelists to just tell us a little bit more about what it is that you do um, in your work on a day-to-day -day basis and how that relates to this effort to, um, to achieve circularity in, in the fashion industry. Um, I'll, I'll start with Carol. Thank you so much and uh, thanks for the film. I think it just recapped uh, clearly where we've been and where we would like to be. Um, where I am currently is really working on, I have two different hats. One is to work with the luxury group LVMH. Uh, I'm the director of Maison Zero, which is a creative platform for regenerative luxury. And the focus for us with LVMH is to really research how we can develop a truly regenerative set of uh, luxury products, not just in fashion, across sectors actually. Um, so it's going beyond circular into, you know, designing to repair, regenerate, restore. And that's quite different to what a lot of designers think of, sadly, think of, the, you know, circularities, upcycling, but it's way more than that. But we are interested in looking into regenerative practice. And then through my Living Systems uh, Lab, um, this is really much more fundamental um, research, curiosity-driven research looking at what we can learn from living systems and deep ecology and that we can actually embed in our design practice. Thank you very much. Lamban, do you want to go next? Hi. Um, Fashion for Freedom is really an opportunity that we created uh, for brands to kind of slowly dip their toes into circular ethical production. Um, I, I think there's a, a brands want to try something that's better than, than um, what's presented there in the uh, globalized uh, production world. But sometimes it's really difficult to because it's such a strange new things with so many um, tenants. Uh, the design, the young designers who wish to go into it really don't have the production background. So on one on the one hand, we act as a conduit for them to um, produce alternatively. We also run what's called a design lab under our philanthropic um, organization in Vietnam. And the design lab run by um, Vicky Rowe is essentially a apprenticeship, if you will. We take students, design students, and place them um, with 
artisans to really help them understand what it takes to actually design in a collaborative effort and to learn all the nuances and difficulties of producing in a way where you have to think every process of the way what circularity looks like, what ethics look like. So that's the design lab and we um, have operated both of those arms for the past 10 years in both um, educating from uh, the ground up and also um, production from the ground up, small to large. So essentially it's both philanthropic teaching and production. Thank you. Jean-Christophe, you're next. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> thank you, Fiona. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this great panel. It's good to be back in London virtually, I guess, and <laughs> waiting for having more uh, flexibility for traveling and discovering and keep discovering great creators and designers, which is probably one of the aim of what we do. So what do we do today? Our day today is to probably be the leading uh, premium market network. We are a B2B model where we help brands, premium brands to present their beautiful products to professional buyers that are duly selected around the world. We help the discovery, we help the connection, we help the workflow, we help the ordering, and very soon the financing. We had a, we had a long time say, because I started the initiative 10 years ago, not with that digital platform, the market was not ready, but trying to build our legitimacy, we created the Born Designers, and then it became the Born Awards, and we had the chance to work a lot in London at the Design Museum with Land Rover to actually celebrate the best in class. What was the notion of being the best? And of course, we've seen over the last years and even more over the last five years, the importance of the definition of a good product is a product with a purpose. And a product with a purpose is obviously, or being a good product, it has to be made with integrity it has to carry a functionality. And obviously, because it's premium, it has to be associated to desirability. And so what we like to do is to keep searching, helping the ones that are creating those beautiful products and dedicated to this intention of circular economy and a responsible attitude in general from all sides. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, well, just to take a little step back first, um, I think useful for us to just give our audience a sense of the problems that the fashion industry is facing right now. Carol, can you can you talk to me a little bit about what you think are the most urgent um, and biggest issues that the fashion industry is facing as it as it tries to clean up its act? For a start, the, the fashion industry is still very petrol centric. You know, most materials produced are either derived directly from petroleum, if you look at all the polyester, uh, but all the grown crops, you know, if you, if you look at conventional cotton, it is also requiring a lot of uh, chemically, chemical based um, fertilizers and pesticides. So I think one of the key challenges is that if we want to remove from this notion of working and being dependent on um, oil, I think that's one of the key challenge. The second challenge, well, is, <laughs> actually, there's a long list of challenges, um, <laughs> is how we can make sure we educate all the fashion designers to truly understand how to operate within a circular economy. They need to learn to create differently. They need to learn to source their material differently. They need to design from beyond upcycling into designing for upcycling. Um, and they need to actually understand ecosystem thinking and how ecosystems work. How, you know, how do you understand regenerative agriculture if you don't even understand how agriculture works, if you don't understand permaculture principles? So I think we need a fundamental new type of fashion education when it comes to design. We need uh, consumers to perhaps also adapt their way of engaging with the way they close themselves. And we're seeing a big shift here with, you know, second sale, you know, that, that market is, mm -hmm. is really increasing both in high street and in luxury. Uh, but I would say every aspect of the fashion industry has to be rethought, redesigned. Um, the only thing that's still the thriving part of the fashion industry is its creativity. But if creativity leads to destruction and exploitation, 
I think fashion has no excuse. So we do need to really start working at every angle of the fashion industry. Mm. Um, I see at the moment a lot of really positive work happening across the fashion industry in lots of different spaces, but it seems to me that it can be often quite sort of piecemeal. You know, you have small ateliers working on material innovation. You have new businesses starting up that are all about resale and rental fashion. You have, um, you know, influencer bodies or organizations trying to get people to think differently about the items of clothing that they already own. You know, we're trying to get people to think more about mending and repairing their fashion. So there are all of these efforts happening um, all over all over the world and in in various different kind of shapes and sizes but but how do we how do we pull all of this together um you know what how do we make this a scalable global cohesive effort um Lamban I'll, I'll toss it to you you know how do we move away from these sort of micro projects um that that are all that are well intentioned um, towards something that really lifts up the entire industry and changes it you know changes the system. Those are kind of like the hors d'oeuvres, right? It's a, uh, it gives us a bite, but definitely isn't enough to satiate the, uh, the, the hunger both for the consumer goods and uh, where, where we need to be. That said, it, it isn't bad because a cohesive global approach to um, circularity is actually a huge challenge for any industry that procures in multiple countries only then to put everything onto a freighter and ship it to another country for production. That supply chain that we've gotten used to in the past 30 years or so um, is actually part of the problem uh, when it comes to making a shift for, for all of this. I think the, the solution or the attempt for the solutions that we're seeing now is what's tangible to designers, what's tangible to a brand that, um, let's say, has a closed system where they're producing and selling in the same country. But if you look at, I, I was just out of curiosity, um, Googled, what's the top 20 companies that did really well during COVID? Number one, beating Nike even, is Lululemon. They're huge more than 60% of their production is in Vietnam or Southeast Asia. Only 3% is uh, in their primary uh, country of sale, which is the US. So by that alone, um, we see a barrier to how they can actually recirculate because the rules and regulations for countries that produce, um, it makes it very easy for brands to come into a place like Vietnam and says, here, come produce, we have high skills, um, low cost. But don't even bother trying to recirculate your waste. The taxation, the duty, the regulation is very high. That said, it's not impossible because we did that with thread. Thread is the uh, it's coat threads. Coats is the, the largest um, and a heritage company of 250 years, uh, a, a UK brand that's been producing in Vietnam for 30 years. And we were able to convince both the government of Vietnam the regulators within the region, um, the, the mediators between the indigenous who we work with and the government of Vietnam and Coates to say, look, by, by just burning your waste, we are contributing, Vietnam is contributing to being the fifth uh, waste producer of, of manufacturing. So here's an opportunity for us to not only get rid of easily seven tons of threads a year, but actually achieved uh, SD, uh, sustainable development goals for people uh, uh, developed, help to develop new economy, not just circular economy, but creative economy and cultural economy that help to, to bolster a very quiet and suffering um, indigenous group. So there are ways to do it, but the designer needs to think outside of just making pretty dresses. The design process here requires the designer to think about re-engineering the supply chain in itself, to rethink creatively how we can kind of turn around the regulations that bar us from, from having a good impactful manufacturing 
manufacturing process to one that is regenerative in ways that we didn't we didn't think of. So I think that there is much opportunity for us to um, think outside of just the framework of product development into process development. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jean Christophe, you work with a lot of um, well known international brands. Um, who who do you think is getting this right? Who do you think is making um, the most progress when it comes to um, redesigning their system to be more circular? Well, I think they all work on it. Uh, I don't think we can identify just one uh, significant responsible group or brand that is not interested by the topic. And what's, what was just described was actually very interesting because uh, I think we, we were really hearing about this notion of supply chain, this notion of Lululemon distributing in a country uh, where, you know, pretty far away from the country of production and all of these constraints and barriers. So I think it was an interesting point of view because we always stand to say, oh, you know, we, we, we should all remember that uh, fashion is still the second largest uh, you know, industry in terms of using water. And, and that's a problem, you know? So I think all, all countries beside the supply chain, beside the element that are fundamental, people, planet, profit, right? These are the three things that everybody is trying to combine with. Um, really, I, I can't pick up a name of the head in the class or, or the super bad ones. I mean, the super bad ones maybe. Some of you can always identify them, you know, do they use fur, do they use this, that, you know, this, they, they, there are a lot of few things that are very obvious. I'm actually looking at, um, yes, those different groups, you sometimes have amazing initiatives, as every year we give an award, I was very, very pleased to see that a magic Italian brand like Ferragamo uh, was at one point dedicated to demonstrate that even an Italian magic historical brand, and, and Carol was saying creativity great, but at what price for the planet? And I think she, she made a point here. Well, Ferragamo made that demonstration of re-editing the famous rainbow shoe, which was one of the most renowned shoe at the time, but they made a point of recreating it with only sustainable you know, uh, uh, responsible elements. Should it be from a non-chemical glue to all of the materials? So I think everyone is trying, everyone is, is, is really trying to make an effort. Now, of course, uh, this combination of profit, let's face it, uh, profit is, <laughs> is somehow the goal and the danger. And uh, yeah, there are some lures, there are some, uh, you know, marketing gimmicks that are being used that are a little bit uh, uh, insulting at times and it unfortunately hides all of those that are really trying to make an effort but as a general trend i think there is a general consciousness as it was said not enough i like the way uh, you know uh, you said uh, it's just the order yes uh, <laughs> I, I agree it's only the start and we should push that you always have the question do we want to be more of a Stakhanovitz and only reward the ones that are doing 100% perfect? Or do you want to be a little bit more encouraging and, and, and promoting you know, best efforts? That, that's the debate. That's, that's the challenge yeah. today. Mm -hmm. I liked what you were saying about you know, um, product innovation and kind of rethinking various products. I guess the, the concern that I always have is we put so much emphasis on product that you uh, you as a consumer sometimes feel as though maybe you can just shop your way out of this situation okay if I only buy sustainable products you know and if I invest in those shoes made from ocean plastics then I'm doing my bit <laughs> and I can go go about my merry way and not worry about the the larger issue and it's kind of moving it away from that so I guess just thinking about who who's maybe listening to this you know what other jobs are out there for young creative designers um, and creative thinkers um, that, are, that, that sort of work in this industry, but maybe are not necessarily so much about 
making new things you know that there, the, there's a system that needs fixing and there's creative thinking and critical thinking that that is required across that system you know what are what are some other areas where young people in particular can come into the industry and make you know do good work and, and make a difference beyond you know where everyone's mind first goes to which is essentially just fashion design question for the group <laughs> well if i can jump in um one in, two interesting comments, you know, family related. Uh, we're seven siblings. One of my sister is a super green, involved person, and uh, we really have quite often that debate. Uh, yes, of course, the idea to reduce production by not necessarily provocating the idea to have more, yes, guaranteeing longevity and not a permanent change. And why not, you know, let's name some of the great success like Vestiaire Collective, after all, you know, producing less and buying what has been already produced. Yeah, but there is the desire of the human side. And I think as, an ele as, a, as another element, the desire of the consumer, I mean, it's, it's beautiful to desire things as long as, as again, Carol said, it doesn't hurt the planet. Uh, and then I think talking about the, uh, we work a lot with students, design school, St. Martin, you know, fabulous school. We've done a few years ago an operation with them. We work in the U.S. with Pasadena Art Centers and others. I think there is an amazing awareness. You could almost think that all of these young creators, designers, would not even conceptualize their work without being sustainable driven and ethical driven. As we know, there is a little bit of a difference here. I think that they're needed on, 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 on both sides, by the way. So I think it's, it's reinsuring. We should definitely encourage more of that. We, we try to do it, but again, I mean, the, the, the young audience, the young designers, for them, there is no other option. The level of consciousness, again, uh, not enough, as it was said, but, but to some extent reinsuring. And it's great that companies like SAP, we have the chance to work with SAP to back some of our big engine uh, of our development has also that consciousness. So I think it exists at all level. Now, I would like to make maybe a, a point or a question for everyone to, to participate. How do we monitor? Because you know it seems to me that the intention those panels, they're more and more frequent. We're all happy to participate. Thank you for organizing it. But it seems to me that the most important thing becomes either an alignment of what do we want to monitor? Is there an agreement on that? I don't know, maybe some of the other panelists are more expert than me in that, or, or you, Fiona, but that's kind of my key question today. How do we monitor and what do we monitor? Ah, I, I was going to jump in because I thought you... I thought you said, how do we money this? And I was like, yes, that is absolutely <laughs> the question that we need to all- Well, that too, that guess. too, you're right. <laughs> well, let's talk about, let's make the business case for this. Let's talk about that, Lamban. So t tell us about how do you make a business case for something that is more expensive to do? It doesn't have to be more expensive. The, what I found out, and, and, and by the way, my, my previous uh, background, really my first career was in finance. So I looked at the world through the lens of mar um, merger and acquisition and business development for the first wave of uh, tech and telecommunication. So having that um, mindset, when you go into a complex situation of supply chain, you're always saying, okay, what's the trade-off? what can we get something for cheaper or faster? Um, but it can't be both, right? And unfortunately in the, in the fashion world, it's kind of like, okay, let's get it cheaper, faster, and let's try to make it sustainable. And we certainly can't have all, all three. That said, part of the reason why is because I think the design process in the fashion world tends to focus first and foremost on the product. What's trending? We need to have Pantone exactly this or else we're gonna chuck it. And I've seen tons and tons and tons of stuff get burned. So maybe the design process is really necessary. Here, it's not just about redesigning a product, it's redesigning a process by which we design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds very meta, but 
in doing so, maybe the first consideration is let's go back and see how, what we can do to make the cheapest process in uh, designing something that account for sustainability, account for circularity. And then we work backward. And if we are able to then hit all of these particular nodes, we then say, well, what's, let's calculate what is the cost of making that product given all the other things that is so important to the next to the generation um, that are there. And I think by doing that, you take easily, and, and I've seen this throughout my, my finance career, easily I can, I can take out 35, 40% in any acquisition because the process by which a company operates um, is allowed to waste so much. And I mm -hmm. truly believe if, if, if we, we start correctly with the student thinking about the end result first, we can take out the, the cost in between so that we can bring something to the market that's beautiful and has function. Mm -hmm. Carol, it looked like you wanted to come in there. What, what <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I wanted to pick up on, on, on both comments, actually in, term of, in terms of monitoring uh, I think that's critical because I think what is lacking in the fashion industry is a fundamental level of infrastructure. Because if you're a designer, how do you know that this material is better in terms of CO2 emission or better in terms of biodiversity support? This sort of um, database information is not available. So as a designer, you don't know. So you have to build a knowledge, you know, bit at a time. If you have a CSR team, it's great. But if you're a small brand, you don't have that. So you need to develop, you know. But then every supplier will have their independent uh, labels, their independent, you know, credits in a way. It's a headache. As a designer, it's a complete headache. So it's very difficult to know how you actually, you know, not a victim of greenwashing yourself as a designer because a supplier said, oh, no, no, this is great. And actually, how can you prove it? We need a fundamental level of infrastructure and we need targets, very clear targets and very clear goals and objectives. Um, so I work with LVMH. They've just published their Live360 uh, environmental strategy with very, very clear goals and targets, 23, 26, 2030, with a set of, of you know, different goals and targets to achieve for different things, circularity, transparency, climate, biodiversity. But without targets, then you have a shifting ground. You know, you do a bit better here in that collection, but then the next season you do something else. So I think targets are really, really important. But without a clear international infrastructure, we also struggle. I usually make the parallel with uh, the way we all moved to a, a digital world. You know, I, you know, I studied and I worked before internet, before mobile phones. I remember when the streets were being dug to, you know, cable all the streets so we could have internet. And when that infrastructure was in place, internet took up. The digital world opened up. With ecology, it's the same. Without the infrastructure that everybody can use and rely on, we won't be able to really make that steps change we really need. We need, we need governments, we know COP26 is coming, COP15 is coming even before that, but that's a real issue. And then the other issues, we talk a lot about climate and carbon, and that's one parameter. So you could say, okay, so that material is, you know, 20% uh, less carbon emissive than that material. That's, you know, one parameter. But biodiversity, how do you assess the impact on biodiversity and how do you begin to regenerate biodiversity? It's far more complex than one parameter. So we can't constantly ask designers to do that. Designers are not ecologists, they're not ecosystem auditors. You know, we need to make sure that that exists for them to be what they're amazing at, this incredible, genuine creativity, which makes our world a beautiful place. It's, it's in human nature to dress in an interesting way or in a personal way. And I think we need to make sure that designers are equipped with the right knowledge, but without the infrastructure, the goals, the targets, the, the, the credibility of the entire chain, it's, it's very difficult for designers. There's a point mm -hmm. of no return where designers is like, well, what do you do? And a lot of designers I meet are not interested in going in fashion unless they can have an ecological strategy. Mm -hmm. So I think brands who are not engaging with that will start to struggle to recruit fashion designers because a lot of the young generation is not interested in those brands. Um, so that's really positive, but you know, yet again, it's you know, 
I'm a designer. It's so difficult to know, okay, well, is this cotton really better than this one? You know, it's it's very difficult. And the other thing, and I wondered whether you, you both can comment on that as well, is the pace of the fashion industry is ridiculous. We need to start to think back about well, what does it mean? Why do we have a collection a week for, you know, High Street. Why don't we go back to collections that will give time for the research, the, the design teams to do the R&D, to do the research it takes to actually choose the right materials in the first place or the right processes. So the whole fashion system has become, uh, I don't know, um, ridiculous, actually, in my view. We shouldn't have that many collections. Just, just on that topic of, of pace, um and the cadence of releasing fashion. Um, obviously, over the last 18 months, some of that was slowed down, you know. I, I'm reticent to talk about the silver linings of the pandemic because I just think it gets you into very difficult and complicated territory and, the, you know, there are very few silver linings. But, but the industry did slow down um, out of, it was forced to. Um, do you feel as though we are at risk of ramping straight back up, um, or is this an op is this a pivotal moment? Is there an opportunity here to not return to normal? Um, what are you seeing from your positions and the conversations that you're having with with various people and bodies? Can I comment first? Mm -hmm. Seen it from from the fourth largest producer in the world in in Vietnam. I fear we are actually ramping up into a very different way that is completely unexpected. I think the biggest risk to the planet is poverty. Because when you have a large um, population of people that, do, that no longer has an opportunity um, in the factory where with COVID, all of a sudden the big brands, the big factories are now finding reasons to actually reduce a huge amount of their workforce with 3D printers, with robotics and automation, you're going to see, and, and this is um, international labor organizations owned um, data and expectation um, to see in the next 10 years, something like 20 to 40 million people out of work going back to the rural area where they're not, they're no longer used to the agrarian life, where they might not want to be there. And without any other economic opportunity, what we're going to see and, and what we, we've um, done in Vietnam is to kind of um, ratchet that, the, this down is to kind of give them a opportunity in a alternative supply chain that would take them out of the, rainforests um, would take them out of killing endangered animals or trafficking endangered animals or cutting down um, heritage trees, heritage meaning over 700 years where it's creating the oxygen that, that we need for, for the whole planet. So my fear is that um, if the second largest supply chain or industry um, only see solutions in the technology, but not see a potential solutions for the uh, humans that currently um, keep this industry going, we're going to find a bigger problem than, than what, what we're seeing. So there is a need to, and we talked about this earlier on, right, where, where there's, there's, there's great solutions or um, understanding in, in agriculture. And now we're, we're kind of starting to um, run after that in the fashion world. I think there's a way to actually connect those two. What, what, what we're doing and why we're in the rural is because um, we're seeing the possibility of taking agricultural waste and actually turning that into textile. And maybe the possibility of looking at um, biology, looking at plant-based in a very, very different way, different, but not new. It's actually quite traditional if, if you look at very old um, mm -hmm. old world and, and old heritage that this this has something that's been going on. We haven't looked at it enough. We haven't really studied the design aspect of old culture and old heritage to really reap the reward of it. So as the transition of people from factories to the, the rural agrarian, maybe there is an opportunity there to kind of merge the two and, and, and come out of it where um, people are finding new opportunities for employment in a really beautiful and um, 
and in this case, biodiverse way, culturally I'm, as well. I'm so glad to hear this. I wish we'd met before. We have, we have Me too. Today, but what you're describing is really what we're working on now. So we're, we're in the middle of writing a new masters of regenerative design which will be fully online and it will be for designers to work in local rural communities where they wherever they are based mm -hmm. so it's really mm -hmm. you know, not about someone moving somewhere and telling people what to do it's about you know you could be in hanoi decide okay what can i do to regenerate my region and and to use design and creativity to help regenerating communities climate and biodiversity so it'll be it'll be very um based on action research project locally specific and it's using design thinking and creativity and maybe they might design an app or a service or craft-based practice and it's to address what you've just described you know moving away from this mass manufacturing fashion factory to how can we use design and creativity to to make communities healthier, happier, wealthier, as well as repair their biodiversity and, and promote and support endangered species. So it's a whole different way of thinking about design. Mm -hmm. and, and we are, from next year, we will train designers all over the world, craft makers who want to have that approach to stay where they are in the world, but to turn, so anything from exactly turning agricultural waste into uh, an interesting materials can, that can be used for local craft that can get, then be sold and benefit families. So that's the whole idea of, of moving into this direction. So I think we need to kind of also be open to new ways to practice creativity, textiles, fashion, craft. Um, and I think we need to inspire the consumers to really research these little gems of incredible new ways of making and to go beyond the machine made into, you know, still celebrate the handmade, the beautifully crafted. And I have to say, you know, there is a, a, a real hunger for the handmade, the craft made which I know when the whole digital thing started, you know, with laser cutting, 3D printing, others are, you know, forget about the handmade. No, the handmade is really valued. Mm -hmm. It's and a new luxury. That's very reassuring. That's very reassuring. Well, we created the infrastructure. You asked for infrastructure. So when we get to travel again, you're invited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I think we've born a very successful partnership out of this conversation, which is great. <laughs> Um, I did want to talk a little bit about this idea of reframing luxury and getting consumers to think differently about what is valuable to them and how to sort of look after the items that they purchase. What do we need to do in that space? How do we continue to champion handmade? Um, and then I guess just a second question on that. You know, the other the reality is that a lot of those handmade products um, and items are more expensive. So, what do we do for the person who has a very limited income? You know, who has to put clothes on the three kids that they have? You know, who can't invest in items that are hundreds of dollars a piece? You know, like how do we make sure that we're being inclusive um, at, as we define luxury? May I answer this first? Sure. Um, from a standpoint of collaboration, and in this case, uh, there is the role of the big producer to play. For example, the hand uh, crafter, the, the, the hand maker, will never be able to supply something fast enough, cheap enough, uh, consistently enough for the global market. They're able to suffice for a very niche market. That said, they're interesting designed is their intellectual property. And if a designer, if a brand takes something that is indigenous, I expect monetary compensation for those indigenous design. That is a language, not a design, not a squiggly. Oftentimes this is their written language. And the infrastructure, the legal infrastructure that should recognize this hasn't been created. And that's something that needs to be discussed on a global basis to recognize the IP of those indigenous makers and crafters. That monetary system can create a fund that then helps to activate the entrepreneurship, 
the design laboratories that can then enable those world communities, those craft communities to then have a language to connect with Carol's uh, design students or, or our own. We need to actually think out of the box in terms of, of the industry and include those finance guys. And by the way, let's start investing in, in the crafters and the indigenous makers. Too often, the finance guy will say, you know, I'm just going to throw a, a billion dollars into tech and hope three of them will become Facebook and the rest could, you know, go away and they'll just start something else. Nobody looks at Crafter, especially from an NGO basis and says, I'm going to bet on you in that same way because you've survived for 300 years, a thousand years, in, in our case, over 2000 years of this really interesting um, IP. I think we need to start looking at those crafters from that standpoint. Why? Because it's to our benefit that these indigenous crafters stay as environmental stewards. So creating not only the infrastructures for better design is, is critical, but creating the infrastructure for real investment into those crafter is absolutely the first thing that we should think about. Mm -hmm. Thoughts from anyone else on on just the sort of reframing of luxury and and how we how we treat luxury differently. I, I think it's a reframing of understanding what is luxury because you know the, the the comment you made about you know not everybody can afford to buy a new coat for their kids every year. No, but should they? You know, I, I grew up, you know, having to wear all my sister's clothes. We mm -hmm. didn't. That was. I mean, you know fast fashion didn't exist it wasn't an option anyway and you know it was all a matter of secondhand clothing your neighbors would you know give you a code because you gave this and there was a real community exchange that happened anyway um you know i i, I think we need to kind of i, I have this in every panel right? i talk to is like, yeah but that's not fair you know those who can't afford it i'm like well it, it's not a matter of affording it because, you know, the people I see, and I won't name the brands, but the very cheap, cheap high street brands are not the people who can't afford it and who struggle to pay. I mean, of course, there are there are a few of them. I see a lot of teenagers with a pile of, you know, jumpers and dresses and coats holding, going to the cashier. And, you know, it's not clearly, yeah. you know, they're teenagers and they can afford it. So I think the whole high street fashion is not, yeah, we need, we need affordable, accessible clothes so everybody can get clothes. And that also happens in the forms of secondhand clothes. You know, I grew up with that. I was not, you know, I'm not ashamed of it. Um, you know, but what I see in a high street stores is not just this. I see a lot of people buying bucket loads of, you know, every week because, yeah. you know, they wear it for an Instagram shoot. And, and that's the mindset we have to eradicate. And I'm quite, you know, vocal about this because that's what the problem, it's not those who can't afford it who need this. Yes, that's great. But, you know, those who can afford 20 garments a week, shouldn't they buy a much more expensive, handmade, handcrafted, and I'm picking up on a note from the comments here, from someone who's well paid doing it by hand, not someone who's exploited mm -hmm. um, with a living wage, but, you know, and then buy something that will last for a lot longer. You know, it, I think there's a notion of why do we, you know, we've got into this frenzy of needing, needing more and more clothes. It doesn't make people happier anyway. So I think there's a mindset we need to also eradicate. So the, the redefinition of luxury for me is that luxury is not for the wealthy only. Mm -hmm. It's also for those who believe in investing in craft, investing in a future where we value people who make things in a respectful um, contribution to nature. And for me, that's how luxury should be defined. You know, I'd be quite happy to buy a super expensive coat if I can wear it 20 years because mm -hmm. it will last 20 years and it will be repaired by a luxury brand. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's very frustrating when you buy something really cheap, you wash it once and it's completely distorted and then you can't wear it again. You know, it's for me, it's such an, a waste. But so I think we need to just kind of rethink that luxury is not just for the top wealthy. There's an aspect of that, but there's also items in luxury which, um, you know, you can buy and then, you know, have it for a few years as opposed to buy 20 times that product. It's, you're going to spend the same money anyway. 
Yeah. I, and I also think it's interesting that a lot of these ideas are not necessarily new ideas. You know, if you look back mm -hmm. as you were kind of getting at um, before, before the sort of mega high street superstore fashion, um, we were just mending, repairing, sharing our clothes and we're sort of just and trying to do normal. that again. It was normal. Yeah, it and it was normal and it wasn't a sacrifice. It was just how you did things. Um, so we, I just think we kind of need to build a system for repairing and mending um, that is obviously much more scalable um, and that doesn't put so much, you know, cause you need to make it easy for consumers. It but, needs but to be I very think, easy. I think for consumers, I remember talking again about the UK, was it about 20 years ago, we had this mad cow disease and then for those of you who've seen that, we had, you know, piles, it was horrible, piles and piles of animals being killed because it, although it's not transmittable to humans, they were killed and destroyed. That triggered a massive investment in organic food. The consumers got it. They thought that has happened because of how we've gone into this very nasty food system. And that's triggered, you know, at the time, I mean, even, you know, I, I won't name brands, but, you know, there's now every supermarket has an organic line. It's not happening in fashion as much because consumers don't understand that what's natural is not ecological. A lot of consumers don't know cotton is highly toxic. So I think there's a lot of education to do in that sense as well. But I think the other thing, and again, we have a finance here with us today, the notion of accounting um, needs to be rewritten because mm -hmm. currently what nature provides is not part of our, our accounting systems. So, you know, we destroy our soils, we destroy our planets, not thinking that actually once we've run out of that, we've run out. So we're not counting for the price and the value of the services provided by nature. That's not included in a product. And if we started to, to, again, international infrastructure legislations, if that had to be built in the cost of a product, fast fashion wouldn't exist because it's just not possible. When you buy a t-shirt, which is three pounds or three dollars or three, wherever you are in the world, how can you think, you know, that crop grew for six months. How does that pay for the farmers, the water use, the pesticides use? How does that pay for the making transformation of the fiber into cotton t-shirt which has most likely happened on the other side of the planet and then it's transported again to somewhere near you how how can you you know the mass don't make sense for me it's such an incredible abstract understanding and if we built in a cost of what has cost to the planet earth and to, to you know the, the service of nature in in every product we make we wouldn't have fast fashion it's just not possible we're reaching the end of our allotted time here. Um, it's been a really fantastic conversation. Um, unless anyone has any final clo clothing, closing remarks that they would like to get off their chest, um, I think we'll leave it there. Um, thank you so much to the panelists and to everyone who listened.